Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Janet Beer. I'm the Vice Chancellor of the University of Liverpool, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here this evening to welcome you to our inaugural Seamus Heaney lecture. Uh, it's an incredible honour and privilege to have secured the support of the estate of Seamus Heaney to establish this annual lecture series, and we're particularly thrilled to be joined this evening by the Heaney family, Mari, Catherine, Christopher and Michael. I probably don't need to tell this audience that the city of Liverpool has for centuries been the connecting point for the Irish diaspora. And so, following the 1985 Anglo-Irish Agreement to encourage greater understanding and mutually enriching contact between our islands, the foundation of an Institute of Irish Studies here at the University of Liverpool was both an important and a logical next step. In the years that have followed, the Institute has quickly established itself as the leading centre of excellence for the study of Ireland in Britain, with unique scholarship outreach and policy impact. Indeed, its research, events, student programmes and expertise do much to foster a deeper understanding between our islands. And in 2007, the Institute was internationally recognised for its important work by the Irish Government through an endowed chair in Irish studies. A more recent recognition of the Institute's work followed earlier this year when the Prince of Wales and the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins, visited campus to, show, to sign a joint patronage agreement. Um, in choosing Irish studies, our researchers and students alike are provided with a real wealth of materials to study and explore, given Ireland's fascinating history, politics, archaeology, and, of course, literature. So to turn to this evening, uh, widely regarded as the greatest poet of our age, with, at one time, his books making up no less than two-thirds of the sales of all living poets in the UK, Seamus Heaney remains, unsurprisingly, a core figure within our curriculum. And I know that his representation of place and identity, his delicate, elegant use of language, and his legacy as a voice for peace within Ireland continues to inspire fresh generations of students and indeed general readers. Seamus Heaney was a good friend to the University of Liverpool and to the Institute of Irish Studies in particular. He gave a lecture here some years ago and I think he is remembered here as elsewhere and I had the privilege of meeting him during his Beowulf tour when I worked in, in Manchester. He was known for his great humility his reaction to taking his rightful place as winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature alongside William Butler Yeats and George Bernard Shaw was to say, it's like being a little foothill at the bottom of a mountain range. You hope you just live up to it. It's extraordinary. So this evening, we will be celebrating Heaney's values, his ability to communicate and to connect with the widest possible audience. We will have the pleasure of hearing Irish actor, screenwriter and director Adrian Dunbar recite three of his favourite Seamus Heaney poems and then the main event, my dear colleague, renowned Irish political scientist Professor Louise Richardson, Vice-Chancellor of the University of Oxford and former colleague of Seamus Heaney at Harvard University. And Louise is giving the lecture which is entitled Airs and Graces. We have much to look forward to this evening and so... Thank you all again for coming, and I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Professor Peter Sherlow. Thank you. I will be brief. I don't think he came to hear me. And I don't think he'd want to hear me reading poetry either with my Belfast accent. We'd be stumbling through it and getting the words in the wrong order and stuff like that. Uh, praise must go to Dorothy, whose idea this was, who two years ago, with one of her many ideas, was then to go for your life. But it was Dorothy who came into the room and had put forward this idea. And I think we need to acknowledge that. And uh, that's the success. There's one thing about Irish people, whenever you clap for the Haiti family, everybody was like, don't look at me. <laughs> and Dorothy was, don't look at me. <laughs> it's, uh, 
It's, uh, it's, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a trait of all cultures, I must say, but it's most certainly a trait of ours. Uh, don't praise me, praise me, don't praise me, praise me. Uh, one of the things, uh, they didn't praise me. Uh, one of the things that's really important is, of course, the whole way in which uh, this embodies the whole concept we have in the Institute of being supportive and of supporting. So this event supports this community and you support us by turning up in such significant numbers. Uh, uh, Janet Beer uh, came here before, just before I came here and had the sense or the stupidity to appoint me. And uh, when we came here, we had six staff and by Christmas we had a 14. So, so very much what Dorothy and I and Frank and all their staff within the Institute have done is really made the place much more relevant but also generated a new generation of scholars are coming through. Please come through quickly, I want to retire. Uh, <laughs> so, that, so that's also critically important as well. And of course the support we have from the Heaney family uh, is also critically, uh, critically important. So uh, I just want to say something very quickly about Seamus Heaney. Uh, I come from an Ulster Protestant uh, background and one of the biggest effects in my life was the poem Dogger. Because like all of us, you were told it was the other side who wrote fault. It's the other side who are driving the violence. It's them. That's the impediment to peace building. And if you know the poem on Docker, it's about a very, the patriarchy of this shipyard worker who's abusive to his family, but he's also abusive. There's the line about the dropping the hammer on the neck of the Catholic worker. And when I read that when I was uh, 13, it really made me start to realise that the conflict was more than what I was being told. And, and, and it was the same as Wilfred Owen, and it was the same as all of those other great writers. It's where art gave you an, a way to understand the world that was around you. But it gave you a way to understand the world that was around you, not in the singular, but in the much broader canopy of what life was. So, so that poem uh, was particularly important. I, I remember that very well. Uh, the other time, I only met Seamus Heaney once. I had just come back from studying in America, and he was lifting boxes out of a car. So I saw this man lifting boxes out of a car, and he seemed to have a bad back, so I thought I would help this man. And, uh, of course, being uh, a 19-year-old idiot, when he turned around, he says, oh, you're that poet fellow. <laughs> <laughs> and he was very gracious. But anyway, he asked me, did I type my essays? And I said, actually, uh, I'm going back to university in a couple of months' time, but I've just come back from America, and I typed my essays. And he handed me a typewriter, which is now in my office, and which I've had for many years. <laughs> It will not be on eBay, do not worry. Or <laughs> well, the Antiques Roadshow. But it was, a, it was a really kind gift. And uh, it sits there. And uh, the only thing is, sometime I must take the reel off and see were my prose as good as his <laughs> when I wrote my third year essay on essays uh, in that sense. So, uh, all of this is great and wonderful and very warm and very generous. And, and, and uh, of course, we thank everybody who's supportive of what we're doing tonight. So, the first person who's going to come up after me is Adrian Dunbar, and I think everybody in this room knows who Adrian is, uh, line of duty, etc. Uh, Adrian is from the fine town of Enniskillen. Uh, it says here in your notes, you were taught by the Christian brothers, and then, <laughs> <laughs> and then it says you attended the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. That must have been such a cultural change. <laughs> There was no beating there, I'm sure, and being given a very peculiar version of Irish history. Uh, but, 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 of course, it, 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 it's another example of support that, that Adrian would give up his time and that he would come here tonight to read some poetry. And uh, I really don't want to read this list. One, because we have to go at 8 o'clock, and uh, clearly this is, uh, Adrian's a man of so many credits and capacity, and, and we had a nice chat about maybe doing some of the Samuel Beckett work that you've uh, invested in and bringing it here to the Institute. So, I shall sit down for a few minutes and Adrian will kindly come up and read us some poems. And we're very appreciative of Adrian doing this for us. Thank you, Dr. Sherlow. And thank you very much to the Institute of Irish Studies and University of Liverpool and the Heaney family for asking me to do this tonight. It's a, a singular honour, I have to say. Um, I just picked three poems that I liked. You know, I didn't sit down and do a hell yeah. <coughs> Tony, 
talks about the uh, Guildhall School of Music and Drama. Yes, it was, it was quite a culture shock, especially as I left the Christian Brothers and worked for two years in an abattoir, <coughs> killing pigs, and then spent a year and a half playing in a band with uh, an Elvis Presley impersonator. <laughs> It was while I was at the uh, Guildhall School of Music uh, and Drama that uh, there was a, a signing of uh, uh, death and the book with Death of a Naturalist. Who I went round um, and I stood in line and Seamus was signing and I got the book and I got him to sign it to my sister. It was her birthday and I suppose in hindsight that was a really bad idea because she, <laughs> she has the first copy, I don't have it. <coughs> But anyway, so I've got three poems for you here this evening. And um, I listened a lot to, uh, to Seamus uh, uh, when he read. And, um, and a couple of times I read things that he commented on. And uh, I was very pleased that uh, <coughs> he seemed to think I was getting it right. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be here. There we go. Death of a Naturalist. All year the flax dam festered in the heart of the townland. Green and heavy-headed flax had rotted there, weighted down by huge sods. Dearly it sweltered in the punishing sun. Bubbles gargled delicately. Blue bottles wove a strong gauze of sand around the smell. There were dragonflies, spotted butterflies, but best of all was the warm, thick slobber of frog spawn that grew like clotted water in the shade of the banks. Here, every spring, I would fill jam potfuls of the jellied specks to range on windowsills at home, on shelves at school, and wait and watch until the fattening dots burst into nimble swimming tadpoles. Miss Walls would tell us how the daddy frog was called a bullfrog and how he croaked and how the mammy frog led hundreds of little eggs and this was frog spawn. You could tell the weather by frogs too for they were yellow in the sun and brown in rain. Then one hot day when fields were rank with cow dung in the grass, the angry frogs invaded the flax dam. I ducked through hedges to a coarse croaking that I had not heard before. The air was thick with a bass chorus. Right down the dam, gross-bellied frogs were cocked on sods. Their loose necks pulsed like sails. Some hopped. The slap and plop were obscene threats. Some sat poised like mud grenades, their blunt heads farting. I sickened, turned and ran. The great slime kings were gathered there for vengeance. And I knew that if I dipped my hand, the spawn would clutch it. This next poem is called Requiem for the Croppies. I suppose when I read this poem first, I was mostly struck by the our great coats. And the barley grew up out of our grave. And that we moved quick and sudden. There was a, there was a gathering uh, of the national consciousness, I think, back to the north through this poem. But the other thing that I love about it is that it starts very small in many ways, and it kind of ends up in this kind of like Cervantes or something. There's something heroic about the language at the end. <clears throat> anyway, Requiem for the Croppies. The pockets of our great coats full of barley, no kitchens on the run, no striking camp. We moved quick and sudden in our own country. The priest lay behind ditches with the tramp. A people hardly marching, 
on the hike. We found new tactics happening each day. We cut through reins and rider with the pike and stampede cattle into infantry, then retreat through hedges where cavalry must be thrown. Until, on Vinegar Hill, the final conclave, terrorist thousands died, shaking sides at cannon. The hillside blushed, soaked in our broken wave, they buried us without shroud or coffin. And in August, the barley grew up out of our grave. And the last poem I've always loved this idea of the poet as a seer. And I think a lot of, uh, of Seamus' works d dealing with. Um, with, with Greece in particular, <clears throat> there's a lot of kind of looking into the future. And where this poem, Anything Can Happen, was written, was written before a lot of the images that will come into our head. Um, when I read it now, it was, uh, had, had actually happened. So, anything can happen. Anything can happen. You know how Jupiter will mostly wait for clouds to gather before he hurls the lightning. Well, just now he galloped his thunder cart and his horses across a clear blue sky. It shook the earth and it clogged the under earth, the river Styx, the winding streams, the Atlantic shore itself. Anything can happen. The tallest towers be overturned those in high places daunted, those overlooked, regarded, stropped beak fortune swoops, making the air gasp, tearing the crest off one, setting it down bleeding on the next. Ground gives, the heaven's weight lifts up off Atlas like a kettle lid, capstones shift. Nothing resettles right. Telluric ash and fire spores boil away. Thank you very much. Thank you. Breathtaking. Uh, I was just transported back to the classroom when you were first introduced to poetry and just that, that sense of the curiosity that it stimulated in your mind, etc. Uh, not for everybody in the classroom, of course. There were those who didn't like literature, who wanted to do the sciences and stuff like that. But it was the, it did capture, and then it made you form new friendship groups the people who liked certain types of music or who liked culture, who liked art, and those who didn't. And so all of this stuff's important and not just in a changing your view of the world, but how you form friendships and the, how you form interests. <coughs> at that age. Anyway, I'll stop talking about myself. Not, that's the way we're here. Uh, uh, and very kindly, uh, the first speaker uh, for our lecture, uh, inaugural lecture, is Professor Louise Richardson, who's the Vice-Chancellor of the University of, uh, of Oxford, uh, previously Price, uh, Principal Vice-Chancellor of the University of Andrews uh, from Ireland, uh, a graduate of Trinity, where, where she studied history, and a PhD from Harvard, where 25 years was spent at the faculty of the Harvard Government uh, Department. Uh, also, latterly, an Executive Dean of Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, Louise currently sits on the board of the Canadian Corporation of New York, the Booker Prize Foundation, and numerous other charities. A political scientist by training, uh, Professor Richardson is recognized internationally as an expert on terrorism and counterterrorism. Being from Belfast, I always wonder what an expert in terrorism means. <laughs> but of course, this is the scholarly <laughs> contribution. And uh, what's critically important, of course, is this massive body of work which, which talks about how we transform uh, political violence, terrorism, into democracy, uh, including the books Democracy and Counterterrorism, Lesson from the Past, What Terrorists Want, Understanding the Enemy, Containing the Threat, and the Roots of Terrorism. So, without further ado, Louise, you're very welcome.
Vice Chancellor, Heaney family, distinguished colleagues and guests, friends and devoted readers of Seamus Heaney, thank you for inviting me. I'm deeply honoured and, in truth, surprised to have been invited to give this lecture, as I'm no scholar of literature, Irish or British. I'm just one of the many, many people who admired Seamus Heaney and had enormous affection for him. This combination of admiration and affection is rare. There are many people we admire, fewer by the day it seems, but um, <laughs> a, sm a smaller number for whom we have deep affection, but the combination is unusual. Yet Seamus evoked this in people, admiration for the work and affection for the man. There are many people, poets and scholars of poetry, who can speak more knowledgeably about his work, and others, like his family, who can speak more knowledgeably about the man. I'm delighted to have been asked to speak about him at all. I knew Seamus on and off for about 30 years. It says a great deal that to everyone he was always Seamus, not Mr. Heaney, Dr. Heaney, Professor Heaney, just Seamus. He wouldn't have wanted to give himself airs. We arrived in Harvard around the same time, the early 1980s, two fairly impecunious Irish people out of what might be called, but he would not have called, our comfort zone. Harvard had the time, at the time had a system very loosely based on Oxbridge colleges. First year students lived in Harvard Yard, older students lived in one of 13 houses. The university sought to create an intellectual life in the yard and the houses by having a few academics, graduate students, live amongst the students. Now, for a foreigner unsure of their financial stability, this was a great gig. You got free room and board, had no transport or utility costs, and you lived a stone's throw from Widener Library. Seamus lived in Adam's house, I lived in the yard. I knew Seamus was in Adam's house. I probably heard through a family connection as I had a cousin, I had a cousin, Thomas Kinsler, who's a poet. But with typical Irish reticence, I was not about to approach him. I had an American friend, Bill, however, who lived in Adam's house and had no such reticence. He told Seamus about me and arranged for us to meet. Thus began our unlikely friendship. Seamus was about 20 years older than us, but once a week, we would go out to a local pizza joint, Bertucci's, which had a bocce alley. We would play bocce, drink beer, and experiment with different types of pizza. I always remember Seamus asking, do you think anchovies would go well with pineapple? <laughs> um, will we try? They do, and we did. <laughs> we would then repair back to my student rooms in Harvard Yard. By way of a couch in the living room, I had a single bed with cushions at the back and no frame. Seamus would always sit on the couch, and as the night wore on, the mattress would gradually slide off the base towards the floor. But we would all keep talking about Harvard, about America, about Ireland, and about books. For hours after he'd left, I would walk my room, remembering the turns of phrase, the use of language, the layers of meaning and simple sentences that Seamus threw out casually as we whiled the evening away. Brilliant, friendly conversation can be nourishing in the same way as poetry. It can, I think, be the rain that makes your own thoughts grow and change and ripen. Talking with Seamus was a joy that long outlasted those playful, botchy evenings. It was inspiring. And in talking about Seamus this evening, I would especially like to reflect on the ways in which his life and his work continue to offer inspiration. Seamus would spend the spring semester at Harvard every year, and he would count the days until the spring break when he could return to Mary and the kids. It was an uncomfortable and lonely existence. One year, the family came and they rented a house off Kirkland Street, and he seemed more at ease. But I never felt he was completely relaxed at Harvard, even later when he was most celebrated. He was always anxious to get home. He served semester-long stints as Boylston Professor of Rhetoric and Oratory until 1995, when, thanks to the Nobel Prize, he didn't need to do it anymore. 
He became instead the Ralph Waldo Emerson poet in residence, meaning he stayed for only a week or so. He took the post, he told me, to keep other universities at bay. In the course of his time at Harvard, Seamus went from being a little-known poet in the 80s to a major celebrity in the 90s. His later lectures were mobbed with what were known as Heaney Bobbers, and he was besieged with requests for talks, openings, endorsements, and Irish events of all kinds. The Irish of Boston were delighted that one of their own had finally conquered the Anglo bastion of Harvard. He had an acute sense of personal obligation to both people and institutions and agonized about many of these requests. He talked to me about some of them. What to do when a prominent Irish American asked his endorsement of a very bad book? Or when the Houghton Library wanted to buy his papers? He felt the papers belonged in Ireland, but was also, also considered himself under an obligation to Harvard because of the university's generous hospitality over the years. As he became more famous, I slipped into the background, never presuming on a relationship with him. But if he ever caught a glimpse of me at the back of a lecture theatre, he'd welcome me as an old friend. I carry so many memories of individual sentences as if he said them this morning. Seamus came to my rooms in Harvard Yard to celebrate my MA in June 1984. He looked at the spread on the table and said with a smile, cucumber sandwiches, no less. An innocent enough comment, but clearly conveying in the gentlest way that it was far from cucumber sandwiches in Harvard Yard that he and I were both reared. As the years went on, the graduate student gang dissipated, and he embraced my husband and visited us in our home, where we had a real couch. He, he, he understood that having married a doctor, in my parents' eyes, I had reached the pinnacle of success. <laughs> On one occasion, in 1994, he arrived and said, expecting company, I see, to which I replied, yes, Bill and Andy and Beth, the old graduate student gang, are on their way. He smiled and was, as ever, too polite to point out my stupidity, but he was alluding to the fact that he had noticed I was pregnant. <laughs> that pregnancy turned out to be a very difficult one as I had cancer at the time. As I was going into hospital, he sent me a beautiful block print of the poet's chair with an even more beautiful inscription about being here for good in every sense. His generosity with his time and his words was, ex was extraordinary, and it can only have put an enormous strain on those closest to him, who had to share him with the world. In thinking about this lecture, I pulled down from my shelf some of his books of poetry, only to find that several were gifts from him with beautiful inscriptions. Tom and I invited him to our wedding in America in 1988, but he was in Ireland at the time. Rather than simply completing the enclosed reply card, and returning it in the pre-addressed envelope, as anyone else would have done, he wrote two beautiful letters, one to my parents and one to Tom's, none of whom he'd ever met. Seamus severed his formal ties with Harvard in 2006. I did in 2008. We met again in Dublin and in Scotland. At his home in Sandymount, the same house that he had bought on his lecture salary in 1976, you caught a glimpse of the weight on this conscientious, courteous man as the postman delivered mountains of requests to each of which he felt compelled to respond. He repaired to a cottage in Wicklow to write. While Seamus had a longer association with Harvard than any other university, he was not of Harvard, and I don't think he ever felt entirely comfortable there. While he had many friends there and everywhere, his connection always struck me as entirely pragmatic. He needed the income to sustain himself and his family, but he needed to be at home in Ireland to compose poetry. In his entire time at Harvard, he wrote only two poems, both in response to specific requests from the university and quite early in his tenure. One, Villanelle for an anniversary, was composed for the university's 350th anniversary celebrations in 1986. The 19-line villanelle, with its unmistakable evocation of a bell ringing, has two repeated lines. 
A spirit moved. John Harvard walked the yard. And the books stood open and the gates unbarred. The latter has always been for me the essence of a university with books and gates open to all comers. The other Harvard poem was Alphabets, composed for the Phi Beta Kappa literary exercises in 1984. He explained that traditionally the Phi Beta Kappa poem is about learning, so he was about, his was about making the first letters of primary school. There he draws a smoke with chalk the whole first week, then draws the fork stick they call a Y. This is writing. The poem is, of course, about much more than learning to write. It is about recognizing the visible world in the shape of language, and about, as Helen Wendler put it, widening the gaze. The scholar encounters first English, then Latin, Old Irish, and finally Greek, with different shaped letters, lambdas, deltas, and omegas, which resonate with the familiar childhood shapes of corn sheaves, potato pits, and horseshoes. Wendler sees this as implying that when many languages are known, the heart's sympathy may widen, even to include the whole world, a world seen from the astronaut's window as a familiar vowel, the risen, aqueous, singular, lucent O. This is surely true, but alphabets also implies that language is something we can find everywhere, anywhere. It is like a forked stick, something we already have in our hand even before we are educated to point it as a tool, as a divining rod, or a letter of the alphabet. The poem reinforces, as all Heaney's poems do, that poetic language belongs to everyone. It is not a narrow matter of erudition, but a broad one of recognition, of seeing things. The stick, which is also writing, is a means of reaching out into the world. As he wrote in his beautiful poem, A Hazel Stick for Catherine Anne, the stick might be cut from your family tree. And the evening I trimmed it for you, you saw your first glowworm. All of us stood around in silence, even you, gigantic enough to darken the sky for a glowworm. And when I picked open the grass, a tiny brightening den lit the eye in the blunt cut end of your stick. This to me is the illumination of poetry, the writing a simple act with a commonplace object that yet reveals something extraordinary. One of the distinctive delights of Seamus's poetry is the easy connection it insists on between working the lines of the land and working the lines of language, plowing, digging, the tongue and groove of carpentry, the forked stick of the water diviner, the sun bucket of a woman drinking water from a well. All of these activities are compared with writing. The result is twofold. Seamus's poetry creates an absolute sense of the dignity, even the sanctity of rural work, the rhythmic folding and unfolding the land that insists upon the community of manual labor and of life lived in daily touch with the elements, soil, water, air. There is a huge sense of respect here for Ireland's long heritage as an agrarian society, a small town society. He pays tribute in his lines to his grandfather and his father, not only to the beauty of landscape, but to those who've shaped it day after day by their long born heft and toil and suffering and patience. Secondly, the writer is not set apart in an ivory tower or an ivy leave town. Instead, he is embedded, dug in to landscape, its history, its geology, its flora, its fauna, its politics. This work is often sensuous, but it's also satisfyingly hard. There are stones to be lifted, graves to be excavated, grit to be swallowed. He has to keep his ear to the ground, to break ground, to find a glimpse of sky at the bottom of the deep well of the everyday. It was part of Seamus' modesty and his keen eye for Irish reality that he did not prance on the horse of the poetic knight in armour. He preferred to stay grounded. He remained true to his roots, yet his outlook was international, linguistically curious, culturally outgoing. 
It's interesting that although the alphabet is Seamus's own progress from the, desks, from the desks of Anna Horish School to the podium of Sanders Theatre in Harvard, he happily acknowledged that it was also inspired by his reading of a poem by the Polish-American poet Czesław Milosz. In his wonderful Nobel Prize acceptance speech of 1995, Seamus fondly recalled the wonder of first learning, li listening to the wireless as a child. I had to get close to the actual radio set in order to concentrate my hearing, and in that intense, intent proximity to the dial, I grew familiar with the names of foreign stations. Even though I did not understand what was being said in those first encounters with the gutturals and sibilants of European speech, I had already begun a journey into the wideness of the world. At the risk of being political, but as a political scientist, I can't help myself, um, this outlook on the world, this deep rootedness in a place, rural Ireland, and yet deep sympathy with people far beyond in both place and time, stands in stark contrast to much of what we hear today. Seamus was deeply rooted somewhere, but he was beloved anywhere and everywhere. With deep roots in Ireland, he was a citizen of the world, and he knew well what citizenship meant. The question of Seamus's citizenship came to the fore with his inclusion in the Penguin Book of Contemporary British Poetry, edited by Blake Morrison and Andrew Motion in 1982. Having been born in Derry, on the northern Irish side of a troubled border, Seamus was entitled to both Irish and British citizenship. In fact, he got a British passport before he got an Irish one. He told the story that he got a British passport when going on a pilgrimage to Lourdes. A friend told him that if he were living in the Republic of Ireland, he wouldn't need a passport, as Lourdes was part of the jurisdiction. <laughs> in, in the late 60s, Seamus had been included in an anthology of Commonwealth poetry and a compilation called Young British Poets Without Protest. But things were different in the 1980s, and he did protest his inclusion in the Penguin Book of British Poetry, albeit playfully. In his pamphlet, An Open Letter, he famously wrote, Be advised, my passport's green. Our, no glass of ours was ever raised to toast the Queen. As he said himself, this was meant to have a bit of merriment to it. He wasn't being strident, he didn't know how. But he was characterizing a culture, Catholic Ireland, in which people did not stand to toast the Queen. He pointed out, of course, that when in a formal setting, he had always thought it the courteous thing to do, to stand and toast. This issue resonated deeply with me. Shortly after it was announced that I had been appointed Principal of St. Andrews and while still living in the US, the Scottish Government invited me to the Ryder Cup in Valhalla. I should have appreciated then just how important a role golf plays in Scottish society and prepared myself for what was to come, but that's another story. Um, at the end of the formal dinner, we were asked to be upstanding for the royal toast. I was immediately seized by a range of conflicting emo emotions and silently recited Seamus's words to myself. <laughs> My passport's green. No glass of ours was ever raised to toast the queen, as I wondered what to do. Courtesy took over and I conformed while asking myself if I was betraying my culture, my country, my ancestors, had I done a terrible thing by accepting this job in Scotland. My crisis, while acute, was momentary, as the royal toast was immediately followed by the toast to the president. Not the president of the golf club, as I'd assumed, but the president of the United States, George Bush. This time I really gulped. <laughs> and decided that toasting the Queen wasn't so bad after all. <laughs> in 1989, Seamus was elected uh, Professor of Poetry in Oxford. Reflecting in his last Oxford lecture on an open letter and its statement about his passport being green, Seamus said he preferred to envisage the poem conferring dual citizenship. I wrote about the colour of the passport, not in order to expunge the British connection in Britain's Ireland, but to maintain the right to diversity within the border. 
to be understood as having full freedom to the enjoyment of an Irish name and identity within that northern jurisdiction. There is nothing extraordinary about the challenge to be in two minds. If, for example, there was something exacerbating, there was still nothing deleterious in my sense of Irishness and the fact that I grew up in the minority in Northern Ireland and was educated within the dominant British culture. My identity was emphasised rather than eroded by being maintained in such circumstances. One can only imagine what he might have made of the saga of the French manufactured new blue British post-Brexit passports. His words about dual citizenship and embracing the challenge to be in two minds have particular force today. In a world where borders and political factions are hardening and where petty nationalism spreads fear that cultural identity may be eroded by newcomers, we need poets to remind us that being doubtful, double, Derry and Dublin can be a source of enormous cultural strength and imaginative vitality. The state that allows one to be in two minds, to have more than one tradition and identity, and to entertain the value of more than one opinion, is not politically weak. It is vibrant, inclusive, diverse. It can think laterally and bilaterally. It is not anxiously introspective and isolationist, but playfully outgoing and polyphonic. Seamus' work communicates the strength of an open hand and an open mind. My daughter, Kira is far too cynical for someone her age, and like so many millennials, expects nothing from the political establishment and political life. But on the 26th of May last year, the day after the Irish referendum, I received a WhatsApp message from her, from a bar in Copenhagen, that read simply, history says, don't hope on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the longed for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. You'll recognize, as I did, the cure of Troy. After the terrorist atrocities of September 11th, Seamus wrote, if poetry has a virtue, it resides in its ability to bring us to our senses about what is going on inside and outside ourselves. As human beings, we crave this realization, and one of the most observable proofs of such craving was the general and urgent quest in the wake of September 11th for poems that would be equal to that moment. I believe that in this time of political brinkmanship, of fearful rhetoric and angry division, his words are equal to, the, to our moment. They are deeply humane. His poems are, in fact, indispensable. Helpfully, he identified the quality that makes a poem so. He wrote, one thing is certain, the indispensable poem always has an element of surprise about it even perhaps a touch of the irrational for both the reader and the writer. It will possess a soothsaying force, as if it were an oracle delivered unexpectedly and irresistibly. Often his poems <clears throat> describe such moments of unexpected epiphany. In the skylight, the moment when the slates come off is a small domestic miracle, extravagant, sky entered and hell's surprise wide open. In Balna Hinch Lake, it is the utter mountain mirrored in the lake, which entered us like a wedge knocked sweetly home into core timber. In that moment, something in us had unhoused itself. In proscript, postscript, stepping out of the car along the flaggy shore of County Clare grants a dramatic view of a lake whipped up by wind and the earth lightning of a flock of swans. That seemingly random decision while on a journey to make time to stop moving to step out and expose oneself to the buffeting of the wind and the play of light produces an emotional revelation. You are neither here nor there, a hurry through which known and strange things passed, as big soft buffetings come at the car sideways and catch the heart off guard and blow it open. I find it significant that in all these poems, Opening up is associated with gifts of self-renewal. When we are unhoused, blown open, made vulnerable, something wonderful happens. Sky enters and holds surprise wide open. We reassess, we appreciate, we are freshly exposed to the elements of ourselves. 
Great poetry is a skylight, a skydive, a skeleton key to free us from the coffin of cynicism and worry that too often threatens to bury us alive. And it shares this gift with all its sister arts, from painting to music, from film to dance. This gift of openness to everything, creative freedom, empathy with other human beings, um, living and dead, telling new stories, the possibility of imagining things differently and better. It seems worthwhile to restate the infinite value of these practices because we are living through a period when the humanities are under fire. In concert with a renewed political emphasis on closing down borders, detaining and deporting non-nationals, and withdrawing from previous international agreements, has come a narrowing of the syllabus that governments are prepared to support. I see these forms of anxious constriction as related and worrying developments. Music and foreign languages, for example, are no longer considered necessary elements of a state school education deserving of public funding, despite strong evidence that they promote children's psychological well-being and their learning across the curriculum. The result is that most children who do not have access to private lessons are excluded from further study and careers in these subjects. The Warwick Commission report of 2015 found that overall participation in arts subjects is falling among school-aged children, with between 2003 and 13 a 50% job drop in GCSC numbers for design and technology, 23% for drama, and 25% for other craft-related subjects. Universities, too, are threatened with a future in which public funds will support only students taking degrees related to science and technology. There is talk, much of it, from MPs themselves privileged to be raised on a rich diet of arts and social sciences, uh, of arts degrees being worth less than the high costs of university tuition are when the high costs of university tuition are computed against the graduate salary students can, on average, expect to earn. The implication of this grimly utilitarian rhetoric is that arts are luxuries. They are dalliances for the children of the rich, extras, as dance lessons once were in the curriculum of Victorian young ladies. As a society, we cannot afford them. The needs of the individual and the community are better served by learning that leads more directly to a quick buck. Seamus would strongly have repudiated this view. In fact, books do make bucks in Britain. The creative economy is estimated to contribute a net value of over £100 billion to Britain's GDP. It is vital to the economic health of the sector that diverse talent is not lost because the most gifted young writers, actors, musicians, dancers and artists of the future, supremely gifted as, as Seamus was, never found their calling or lived in the wrong postcode to be able to respond. But when we demean the arts, we stand to lose something even more profound. The humanities may have been reconceived as a business, but it remains their true business to make us reconceive our humanity. As Seamus so eloquently argued, poetry and the arts fortify your inner life. Listening together and knowing things together is what a culture is. He also said, the poet is on the side of undeceiving the world. An echo perhaps of W.H. Auden's assertion that the primary function of poetry, as of all the arts, is to make us more aware of ourselves and the world around us. I am quite certain it makes us more difficult to deceive. So I say, yes, we need STEM subjects, but to follow the organic metaphor through, we also need flower subjects, film and fashion design and fine arts, law, languages and literature, oratory and opera, world history, ethics and epistemology and religion. We need to stay open to cross-pollination, to bloom as a society that is more than its economy, as a nation that is more than one nation. Poetry is part of how we stay open, how we recognize our, share our shared vulnerability as a strength, how we admit the world. Seamus' poetry has, in this regards, as he did, an irresistible charm. On his tombstone in Balahi is written a line from one of his poems. Walk on air against your better judgment. It's a line that brings a smile and a tear 
How often in recent times have we needed the admonition to try to be light, to find light when facing heavy realities? Yet we must do our best to let his words breathe joy and curiosity into us, inspiring us with a lighter heart and a determination to look outward, to stay open to the euphoria of living and breathing despite our anxieties and misgivings. One of Seamus's many obituaries in the Belfast Telegraph reported locals saying approvingly that he talked like a farmer's son. He was down to earth. He had no airs and graces. I would have to agree with first assertion. He was of the earth, earthy, his voice warm and unaffected. He had no airs, but grace he had and lyrical abundance. I met Seamus again in Scotland when he came to the poetry festival Stanza in March 2010. He had cut down on engagements by then, but was still receiving invitations from all over the world. He explained that he had not gone to Venice because you are there to decorate the program, a celebrity, but had come to Fife because of connectedness, connectedness to the place and to the many poets there he counted among his friends. He came back to, to St. Andrews again in June 2013 to give a reading of some of his poems which are translated from and inspired by medieval literature. The reading was part of a conference called the Middle Ages in the Modern World, convened to celebrate the 600th anniversary of the university. It took place on the same day as a graduation when he sat in the audience and cheered on Mary McAleese, the Irish president, as she was awarded an honorary degree. He gave his talk in a modern, very unmedieval lecture theater and was introduced by the organizer, Chris Jones. Chris had been very keen to get Seamus to the conference and tried to get me to use my friendship with Seamus to encourage him to accept, which I was very loath to do. Seamus told this story in his introduction of Seamus. As we drove back to my house after the lecture, the fact that we drove rather than walked along the seafront itself an indication that he had slowed down, Seamus said how glad he was that Chris had told the story. He had thought about doing it himself, but didn't want to give himself airs. I remember laughing out loud and telling him he was the only person on the planet who could possibly imagine that acknowledging the friendship between us raised his status more than it did mine. <laughs> but he was like that, deeply Irish in his reluctance to seem self-important, uh, though the world was happy to lay laurels at his feet knowing that he had earned them. He and Mary stayed with us a couple of days and when they left, he gave us an inscribed, illustrated print of a drink of water. It ends with the lines, Where I have dipped again to be faithful to the admonishment on her cup, remember the giver fading off the lip. He gave us all so much. His death, two months later, to quote the devastating line from Proscript, caught the heart off guard. It was too soon. We should have been celebrating his 80th birthday this year. It would always have been too soon to lose his genius, his gentle heart, his generous spirit. But he has left us words on the cup, a taste of well water, a gift, a benediction. I thank him from the depths of my heart. I am grateful to all of you for sharing this evening with me and for offering me the opportunity to remember Seamus as we celebrate the inauguration of what I'm sure will be a long inspired and sustaining series of Seamus Heaney lectures. Thank you. Thank you.